visit www.comlexflashcards.com for an up-to-date information on how to prepare for the complex. Today's topic is diverticular disease. Now, diverticular disease are basically outpouchings of the mucosa and the submucosa, which is the false diverticuli, that herniate through the colonic muscle layers in areas of intraluminal pressure. Most commonly, these are found in the sigmoid colon. Now, diverticulosis is the most common cause of acute lower GI bleeding in people over 40 years of age. Diverticulitis is due to the inflammation and potential perforation of a diverticulum secondary to possibly a fecalith impaction. And so here's a nice diagram showing you the diverticula as they're outpouching in different areas here. Now let's talk about some of the risk factors. Well, risk factors include a low fiber and a high fat diet, advanced age. For example, 65% um, of diverticular disease occurs in patients over 80 years of age as well as um, Ehler-Danlos syndrome and other connective tissue disorders are risk factors for patients. In terms of the history and physical exam, diverticulosis is often asymptomatic. There's bleeding, which is painless and sudden, and generally patients present with hematochesia and symptoms of anemia such as lightheadedness, dyspnea on exertion, fatigue, Diverticulitis, however, presents with left lower quadrant abdominal pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, and constipation. Perforation is a serious complication that leads to possible shock or peritonitis. Here's a nice diagram, and as you can see, over here is diverticulosis. And here you can see another picture, and there's bleeding here as well. In terms of diagnosis, a CBC may show signs of leukocytosis. Um, diagnosis is based on a possible AXR, and you can use that to rule out free air, ileus, or signs of obstruction. Colonoscopy or barium enema are sometimes suggested. However, a sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy should be avoided in those with early diverticulitis because you want to prevent any risk of perforation. And in patients with severe disease or in those who show lack of improvement, sometimes an abdominal CT may be beneficial to reveal an abscess or free air. Now in terms of the treatment, uncomplicated diverticulosis, patients here can be followed and placed on a high fiber diet or fiber supplements. But for diverticular bleeding, um, and if this bleeding stops spontaneously, then you definitely still um, need to make sure that they're well hydrated, um, check their hemoglobin levels, you know, if the bleeding doesn't stop, then go for an angiography with possible embolization or surgery. For diverticulitis, you want to make sure that you give the bowel a lot of rest, and so that includes patient, putting the patient on NPO, um, possibly giving the patient an NG tube, and definitely starting patients on broad spectrum antibiotics such as metronidazole or a fluoroquinolone or a second or third generation cephalosporin if the patient is stable. You want to also again make sure that you avoid a sigmoidoscopy or a barium enema to prevent risks of perforation in diverticulitis. And for perforations um, you want to perform an immediate surgical resection of the disease bowel and one of the procedures um, that's commonly used is called the Hartman's procedure and it, that includes putting a temporary colostomy. Again some of the other complications are infection, perforation, fistula, obstruction and bleeding. Like I mentioned in uncomplicated diverticulosis patients do benefit from a high fiber diet Fiber keeps the stool soft and lowers pressure inside the colon so that the bowel contents can move through easily. And the American Dietetic Association recommends 20 to 35 grams of fiber each day. Here's our references. And again, for complete lectures, visit comlexflashcards.com 
and I wish you all the best in your complex preparation.